The NBA can now negotiate with anyone it chooses to on its next media rights deal. A major Olympics controversy is in full swing. And later we have Randy Johnson, one of the best and most intimidating pitchers in history, talking about baseball and wildlife photography. It's Tuesday, April 23rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NBA's national broadcasters, ESPN and TNT, owned respectively by Disney and Warner Bros. Discovery, had an exclusive negotiating window with the league for its next set of broadcast deals, but that window ended on Monday, and now the NBA can speak to anyone it wants to. Disney and Warner Bros. Discovery are likely to be part of the final package, but NBC is looking to get back in, and we're likely to see the league team up with at least one major streaming partner. Apple, YouTube TV, Amazon, and Netflix are all reportedly interested. The first three already have major live sports deals, while Netflix has only dabbled in events where it has full creative control. But the in-season tournament could thread the needle as an event that Netflix could make its own. And then there's Spulu, the coming sports-focused streaming service from Disney, Warner Bros. Discovery, and Fox, which is receiving a healthy dose of antitrust scrutiny. That looks on paper like a potential NBA streaming partner, but it's not clear how much of a company there is to negotiate with at this point. At the moment, Amazon, YouTube, and maybe Peacock still seem like the most likely streaming partner options for the league's new deal, which will start with a 2025-26 season and will shatter the NBA's previous record. The New York Times recently reported that 23 Chinese swimmers tested positive for a banned substance seven months before the Tokyo Summer Olympics in 2021. The positive tests were not disclosed, and the athletes were allowed to compete, and several of them won medals, including three golds. Some of those athletes are expected to be in Paris for the coming summer games. China claims that all 23 of them ate tainted food that had trace amounts of trimetazidine, a banned substance that aids blood flow. They did not explain how that would have happened, but that was apparently enough to stall the World Anti-Doping Agency, which said it looked into the matter and found no reason to doubt the story. That was not the case a year later when a Russian figure skater, Kamila Valieva, tested positive for the same substance, used the same excuse, and was eventually banned from the 2022 Winter Olympics. The U.S. Anti-Doping Agency has issued multiple statements saying that the World Agency failed to follow protocol, quote, even if you buy their story that this was contamination and a potent drug magically appeared in a kitchen and led to 23 positive tests of elite Chinese swimmers. The U.S. ADA also pointed out that the drug in question here is not one that tends to show up in potential cases of legitimate contamination. The Olympics start on July 26th, those swimmers will either be in or out, and at least one major country won't be happy. All right, thrilled to be joined now by Hall of Fame pitcher and photographer, Randy Johnson. Welcome, Randy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So I actually want to start with your, your photography life career. You're a very serious photographer. Uh, do you think of it as a prominent hobby or a full-on second career? I guess it could really be either, uh, but I just uh, it's just something that... Um, because I'm not doing photography every day. Um, I have other interests as well, family and baseball. And I think it's just something that's given me an outlet and um, and the same way to go about um, a photography trip is kind of the way that I would go about the day that I was pitching against the team that was coming into town. You know, I would have already prepared and known you know, all the strengths and weaknesses of my opponent and done my research, you know, done my due diligence. It's no different than if I'm going to Africa or going on a photography trip. I'm doing all my research and I'm knowing where I'm going to go and and why I want to go there and what the hopes of seeing, um, you know, are there. And, and, you know, as much as you know, what equipment am I bringing based on the environment that I'm going to be at? You know, or think, or is the subject matter going to be close, far? That kind of dictates. So I think there's some parallels to my photography as there was on uh, baseball when I was pitching. A lot of research and, uh, and, uh, and just being prepared because of the research and the preparation that I put forth. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And you know, you've taken images of wildlife, done a lot of rock concerts, plenty of travel, photography, some right. sports, of course. Do you have a favorite subject? 
Uh, I really don't. Uh, they're all a little different, and that's what's so interesting about it is that you, because they're different in a certain capacity, um, that uh, you can get uh, you 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 have to have um, you know the ability to shoot different things. Uh, there's different settings and different uh, equipment that I'm going to be using for the various uh, subject stuff that you just had talked about. And, um, and so trying to be efficient at all of those has come over time. And I kind of like the ability to be efficient at multiple things, uh, instead of just one thing. Um, and so the, the, the travel photography that I do, the Africa photography, the concerts all started back when I was in uh, college shooting for the college newspaper. Uh, there was a real um, need for that at USC, shooting for the college newspaper. They might be doing a review of the concert, and they would obviously need a picture of the concert. So I would go and take a picture of the concert and bring it back. And and I just enjoyed that. I Most people really enjoy music, whatever genre of music it is, and I'm no different. And then you put, you know, the passion of photography with with the music and it's it's pretty fun to look back at some of the pictures that I and I don't have many anymore but you know yeah, I'm looking back at some of the concerts that I took back in the uh in the early 80s when I was at college and I look at them now and they they hold up just as well as any of the concerts that I've been to in the last 10 years 15 years do you have any uh, any fun stories about maybe a wildlife shoot that you've been on or you know places you've been, things you've, you've witnessed, um, uh, just make for a good story? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, going to Africa and say being in your Jeep and you're sitting up on the bluff and you're getting ready to watch 10,000 wildebeest crossed over the Mara River, and that's part of the Great Migration. They are start off down south and they're moving up north, um, and traveling about 1,800 miles, and they've been doing it for thousands of years. And their their reason being is because they think that you know the the pastures are greener on the on the other side of the river, and so they've been doing it now, like I said, for thousands of years. And and um, watching that, you know, it, it is. Um, you know, if you've never seen that, and most people see it on, on like National Geographics, I mean, to see it in person, to see it develop on the other side, you're you're looking across the river and you're seeing thousands of wildebeest and zebras, and they want to come over to your side. Well, the Mara River is pretty rough. You know, there's current. Uh, there's there's going to be some current in the river, and then you got the huge twenty foot Nile crocodiles sitting on the bank and you're going to have to deal with those uh <clears throat> usually one of the wildebeest is going to be uh, uh, uh not going to make it you know uh and so that kind of stuff uh is just uh interesting to see the first time and then you become more aware of the situations and what to watch for uh to make for a better picture uh and so some of the uh, exhibits that I've had, well, one uh, being at the Fenimore uh, Art Museum in Cooperstown, New York, I had uh, an exhibit there for seven months, and it consisted of 30 photographs that I had taken from different regions of Africa, and when, when that ran its course, now I have one finishing up the end of this month in Scottsdale at the Scottsdale of the Performing Arts, but one of the photographs that I have I, I took from my Jeep, and you can see there's thousands of wildebeests on this big bank, and they're coming down the embankment, and some of them are crossing the river, and you can see how strong the current is because they started off in a straight line, and now they're kind of like, it's a big like uh, loop, if you will, uh, and then obviously off to the side, you don't see the big crocodile that's probably going to go in the water, and I think that I think 
seeing that stuff live and in person um, over over multiple times and over multiple years, it's really um, it's really uh, you know everyone's a little different because you see different things and some of the crossings are bigger. Some of them can be five to ten to twenty thousand wildebeest. Uh, and it's just sheer chaos. And, you know, back in the day, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there used to be drive-in movie theaters where you would go with your family in the car and you would drive in and you'd never get out of your car. There would be like a speaker and you'd put the speaker inside your car and then you'd have the audio and then the big screen. Well, that kind of defines what it looks like when you're sitting up on this big embankment in with your driver and your guide because there's maybe 20 or 30 other jeeps and they're all watching this and so it's just a it's just a real spectacle it's a it's a real uh it's a real treat when you're uh you know a photographer and you're watching watching all this sheer chaos and and you just don't know what's going to uh, happen and uh and so, um, you know, documenting that with uh, photographs is is what I've been doing the last uh, six or seven trips to Africa in different regions, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, uh, Namibia. And, uh, and then I finally put this uh, gallery together, this exhibit, and I just uh, collectively, I tried to put a little bit of everything so... It's not just animals, it's Ethiopia and some of the biggest red sand dunes in the world in, in, uh, in Social Vlay and, uh, and then Rwanda, silverback gorillas. And so when people come to the exhibit, they can see multiple things that they can go and visit uh, along with, uh, you know, the animals, uh, if you will. Getting to, I mean, everything's more mundane than that, but um, um, switching over to your your, your baseball life, um, your your logo for your photography studio is a dead bird, and for everything <laughs> you did on the field for your incredible career, um, the moment you're probably best remembered for is that just out of nowhere, you know, absurd moment when you know a bird intercepted your pitch and and didn't make it um, uh, through that experience, um. How, how do you think about that moment 23, 20, 23 years later? Yeah, 23 years later, it's still uh, out there. It still seems to be relevant. People still bring it up. Uh, and, uh, and so after 23 years, I'm doing a nice campaign now with uh, directtv.com backslash uh, bird ballpark. Uh, and what they've done is um, they've, uh, they've had me uh, make these uh, bird ballparks with their old satellite dishes uh, because uh, direct TV is no longer satellite and uh, and the campaign is really to try to write myself with the bird that uh, that I uh, hit with the baseball 23 years ago and so it's been uh, a campaign that's just started uh, the commercials just been released I think everybody will think, um, it's really funny. I posted it on my social media, on my Instagram, and the responses um, have been a really funny. Um, it's just one thing after 22 uh, years in the major leagues, it's one thing everybody remembers, you know, that I did. They may not know a lot of my accomplishments in baseball, but they've seen They've seen me hit the bird at one time or another. And so ha making this commercial and having this campaign with DirecTV is very much relevant. And uh, the, two are, the two are connected now. And did you happen to see the uh, the Tandem Halloween costume kind of went viral last yes. year of uh, <laughs> yeah the <laughs> of you and, and the bird? Yeah, well, I, I just think that, uh, you know, I, I guess some of these people uh, were born um like the 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 two youtubers that did that you know uh, that that went viral and it blew up and it was very successful and very creative um and so um you know i would say that they're probably in their 20s and so they probably remember uh, a little bit of my career and 
And uh, but uh, the the beauty of it is it's it's not ever going away. It, it was caught on camera, and someone that uh, you know maybe wasn't born then uh, can actually watch it and see it, and then be in awe of it, and then watch the commercial, and then understand that the the, the connection of the commercial. Uh, and who I am and in the relevance. You know, I was looking at your stats page um, and you pitched more, you, you pitched more than 200 innings in 14 different seasons. Some of those were like 250, 270, a few others, you know, are in like 160, 180. No one does that anymore. That's, you know, it's kind of a previous era thing at this point. Um, and also, of course, we're seeing a whole lot of pitcher injuries. Um, some debate over, you know, is it more prominent or, you know, what's, is it, do we actually see this every year? Every year, I'm just wondering what you think about the modern approach to pitching. I, I'm not sure why there's so many injuries now. Uh, there's a lot of theories uh, because there's a time clock uh, in between pitches, and pitchers don't have enough time to recover after the exertion of throwing that pitch. They got to get back up on the mound within 12 seconds or 14 seconds and throw the next pitch. So uh, it puts a lot of stress on their arm. Um, that that could be. I don't know. You know. I you know. I don't know. I'm um, not a doctor, or, or uh, you know, being able to break down the biokinetics of uh, of pitching. But uh, there was there was those um, injuries while I was playing. There just wasn't as many of them. So something's happening in today's game that's leading pitchers. In the last ten years, there's been a um, you know, upshoot of Tommy John surgeries. And I don't know what the reason is. I, I don't think anybody does. And if they did, then, you know, they would be able to address it. I think a lot of people are, are kind of pointing towards the, uh, the pitch clock, um, and, and thinking that maybe it's, uh, you know, a lot of stress on the pitcher's arm to repeatedly do that and not have enough time in between. I don't know, um, but um, but it, it seems to be a mystery. And uh, but the the game is in a good place. I think with that direct effect, that it it shortened the game up a little bit, and that's what they've been trying to do from about a three hour game to about two and a half, uh, sometimes two two hours and fifteen minutes, something like that. When you're bringing your whole family to a game, you want to be able to enjoy the game and it not be a marathon, if you will, and then be able to go home and and still have a little bit of day left, you know. Uh, and so I think the pitch clock has served its purpose, but at the same time, they're going to have to look and find out look and find out if that has any uh, bearing on some of the injuries that have been happening. I, I don't know. A few quick ones for you before you we let you go. Uh, pitcher today you must enjoy watching. Uh, well, uh, I watch, you know, the, the Arizona team. Uh, Merrill Kelly is one of the pitchers there, and Zach Gallen. Uh, they're they're the, the, the two top-tiered pitchers. Uh, and so I, I, I watch them pitch more than anybody. Uh, there's a lot of fine young uh, pitchers in today's game. Um the question I would have is because there's pitch counts and things like that. I'm wondering if you're ever going to have someone like another Nolan Ryan out there or a Tom Seaver, someone that can go out there and win 20 games, you know, um, a, a multitude of times and strike out 300 batters. Uh, and throw 230, 240 innings. I'm not sure that's going to happen in today's game anymore because the pitchers aren't groomed to pitch that way anymore. Uh, it's more about pitching five, six innings and then letting the bullpen come in. And, and um, you know, my concern would be, you know, I'm out there to win a ball game because that's my livelihood. And if if I'm coming out after five or six innings and the game is still tied one to one and I'm coming out of the game for no other reason than that's the theory in today's game uh, that you're kind of taking away my livelihood in some regards, because I would think that 
you would want to be out there a little bit deeper in the game and have an opportunity to win that game. And, uh, you know, I think pitchers aren't getting the opportunity to win uh, in in games as much as they were back when I was pitching or even before that time period. Was there a hitter today you would least like to face? Well, I faced a lot of Hall of Famers, and I think the one, you know, I, I faced uh, some of the best hitters that are, you know, I probably faced 30 Hall of Famers. So there's nobody in today's game that I would be worried about because I already faced some of the best already. You know, I faced Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, and Barry Bonds, and those were the prolific home run hitters. And there's nobody in today's game that 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 is like that. Uh, you know, so... You know, there's a lot of great there's a lot of great talent in today's game, whether you're a hitter or a pitcher, uh, and that's that's one thing that we can all agree on is that the talent level uh, is amazing for a lot of teams, and um, there's a lot more parity in today's game now too. Uh, everybody's got a little bit uh, better chance to win and get to the postseason by being a wild card team. And um, there's a lot of teams that have superstar players, and uh, it's nice to see that, you know, you know. Other than winning the World Series, what's a favorite moment from your career? Well, the World Series was obviously the main objective uh, in, in my career, and accomplishing that, that was uh, the pinnacle. And then I would say, you know, pitching a perfect game when I was 40 years old uh, against the Atlanta Braves, uh, and then just you know, some of the competitive games that I pitched against other pitchers, you know, and and had those pitching duels like I was talking about. You know, I wasn't out and they weren't out after five or six innings. You know, we were going seven, eight, nine innings. Um, and those were those were called pitching duels. And, you know, uh, you really learn how to pitch in those games and you you really see what you're made of because physically, it, you know, you're in uncharted waters. And if you do that once and you show to yourself you can do that, then you build up a tolerance to to being able to do that. But if you never do that, you're never going to be able to put yourself in that situation. And it's also a mind, a mindset as well. So it's a mindset and a physical set, uh, uh, physical uh, need that you need to be put in those situations. And then when you are you know, you'll be able to get through those uh, a little bit more. Uh, but pitchers in today's games don't aren't put in those situations. You go to the bullpen, and that's the help that they usually get now. Randy Johnson, really enjoyed the chat. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. My pleasure, Owens. Thank you. That's it for today. Leave us a rating and review on Apple or Spotify. We're always interested in your thoughts and feedback. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.